Welcome to the Art of Adventure podcast. This is a paternity leave episode with Dave Stelmacki, host of the Touring Families podcast, and his guest, Scott Tuzinski, the Olympic volleyball gold medalist. And this is the final paternity leave series podcast. I took a little bit of time off. We had a brand new baby daughter at home, and we'll be coming back to you with regular content starting in January. And let's talk a little bit about today's episode with Dave Stelmacki. First of all, Dave, the host, is a client of mine, and he runs the Tours for Families. They they put together trips for families, and this podcast, the Touring Families podcast, is part of their business. And so he interviews Scott Tuzinski, who was a professional volleyball player and gold medalist. And the episode focuses on how Scott was playing in many different countries and leagues around the world and bringing his family along. And he's talking about what it was like for his son to experience growing up on the road, living in different countries, learning different languages, moving from school to school, and what that experience was like as a family of a professional athlete living in many different countries. We'll also hear a lot about the mindset of what it takes to become an Olympic champion, Olympic gold medalist, and how Scott came back from injury, how he brought the team together so that they could become the best in the world during the Olympics when it really counted. So there's a lot of peak performance mindset in here, as well as really cool travel stories from his time living all around the world. So I think you're really going to love this episode. And of course, go and check out the other episodes on Dave's show, Touring Families Podcast. And we will be back to your regular Art of Adventure interview programming coming up. We've got a great interview with professional kayaker Paul Kuthi and Melissa Monty, host of the Mind Love Podcast. So that will be coming after this episode. So without further ado, here is Dave and Scott. Welcome back to the Touring Families Podcast. This time we are with Scott Tazinski. Scott is a former professional volleyball player, an Olympic uh, gold medalist, a college coach, current college coach, right? Yes, sir. And yes, sir. the uh, founder, owner, and uh, the, the leader of Tuzinski's Elite Volleyball Camps. Yes, sir. Um, and so Scott is a, an awesome guest, and uh, I'm excited to talk to him. So I guess we can just kind of jump right in. So you you want to start with your uh, professional career? It was yeah. 2004 when you started, right? Yes, sir. I just graduated. Well, actually, I, I left school before I even graduated in 2004. In high, from uh, high school, right? Uh, for, well, from college. From oh, college, okay, okay, okay. Four, and I went straight to Puerto Rico. It was half season, and uh, I got a professional contract for the last half of the Puerto Rican season. And I finished my my finals and everything from Puerto Rico. Okay. Um, graduated from there, had one, uh, one uh, final paper that I had to write and send on in. And then from there, I kind of bounced around. I went from Puerto Rico to Greece um, and then back to Puerto Rico then back to Greece again, to Spain, over to Slovenia. Uh, from Slovenia, I went to two years in Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, from there, I went uh, to Port- uh, to Berlin, Germany. Then I went back to Puerto Rico again for the third time. And then I went over to um, back to Berlin for four more years, went to China for one year. And then last uh, season, two years ago, was in Poland. So this – oh, Poland. Nice. I'm, yeah, uh, really I'm Poland. Cool. So wait, hold on. So – that was so. This is over a career thirteen of, years. Thirteen year career in how many different countries? Ooh, I think it was nine different countries in thirteen years that we went to, um, and then uh, you know for the first uh, half it was just me and my wife Angel. Yeah. And then for the last uh, second half, really six years, it was uh, me, my wife, and then our son Logan. So, Puerto Rico, Turkey, Germany, Poland. Um, what what else? What was the other ones? I can't even. Uh, it was uh, Slovenia. Slovenia, Spain, yeah. Spain, Belgium, Belgium was in there too. Okay. Um, and so yeah, it was a, a great little great little time overseas. Pre- predominantly, we'd be over there for about nine months, 
And then we come home for three months here uh, in California where we lived. And then six of those years from the middle to the end, I uh, played on the U.S. national team as well. And so then we would be traveling all year for the national team for those four months that I'd be on the national team. When I got on the national team, I got to go overseas a little bit later, which was phenomenal. Oh, okay. Um, but then we'd be traveling, you know, everywhere uh, on the national team, South America, Europe, Asia, yeah. uh, Middle East. Uh, we go every single spot. Um, and so we'd be traveling. I used to be taking about, man, I used to take close to 100 flights a year uh, when Holy I was doing that. With my, with my camps, um, it felt like you were always on the road. It was harder for my wife and my son because – They'd be the one stationed there, and I'd just be hitting out all these different places the whole entire time. Yeah, so I definitely want to talk about that um, with your wife and your son because you know we're all about like families and being yeah. overseas with families. Um, so, but I do want to talk real quick about the Olympics. So, you you're four years into your professional career is when you played in the Olympics and that was in Beijing, right? Yeah, it was about, it was about, uh, let's see, was it four years or five years somewhere in there? Yeah. Four years. You're right, man. And, uh, it was in Beijing, China. And, um, you know, we, uh, it was my first Olympics and my wife got to come over. We didn't have my son until two years after that. And, uh, and I saw on, uh, is it accurate? I looked up your, I was looking up your camps and everything. And I looked up your career a little bit on Wikipedia, just so I had a little baseline. It said you guys got married in yeah. 06. Is Wikipedia correct with yep, your yep, uh, yep. wedding year? Exactly. Okay, cool. 06, two years before the Olympics. And then we had our son in 2010. Okay. So after the Olympics. Okay. So yep. when you went to the Olympics, your wife, you and your wife have been married for a couple of years and you went over to China. Yep. How early, like... When how su- how much earlier before the Olympics start do you go over there? We got there about thirteen days early. Okay. Uh, really, obviously, China is a different beast because you got to adapt to the pollution and the weather and uh, the people, and it's just so much so much stuff you have to get used to, and you got to get used to your new place where you're going to be living for you know another three and a half four weeks. Yeah. In the in the Olympic Village, and so. We got over there early. Um, it was tough in China because, uh, you know, the food wasn't great at all. Really? Um, in the village, especially even in the village, it was terrible. Really? So for, man, for about a month straight, we lived off of McDonald's. Literally really? breakfast, lunch, and dinner every so single you're day. Getting re- so you're getting ready to play in the Olympics. Yep. And you're probably going from eating a pretty nutritious, oh yeah, uh, a fitness-based diet, team. and now you're eating McDonald's. Yep. Oh yeah, we're dialed in on the national team. You know, USA Volleyball spends a ton of money on nutrition um, and performance and all that stuff. And when you get over there, it's like it's all thrown out. The only good meal we would have is when on the days we would practice, which was every other day, and directly after we would go eat lunch okay, so at the Beijing Normal University which uh, US United States Olympic Committee rents out for all the athletes. And they would go and have chefs flown over from the United States and cook you home-cooked meals inside there. But it yeah. was about 45 minutes to an hour from the village. So it wasn't like you could just jump on a taxi and go eat there every single day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, and so we would have lunch there every other day, and that was it. The rest that of the is- McDonald's. So, okay, I didn't uh, plan to talk about this, but this fascinates me. So you've got all these Olympians from all over the world. I'm like so shocked that it would be that difficult for all the U.S. athletes to not be able to go somewhere where they've got steak and chicken and vegetables and everything else that they cook you. And think about this. Is a lot of our matches, we had the 10 p.m. match, uh, five out of the eight matches that we played in. And so – 10 p.m. doesn't normally start until about 11.30 p.m. Because you have all these matches before you that run late. Okay. And so we would be getting home after drug testing and all this stuff at about 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. And we go straight to McDonald's and eat McDonald's at 3 o'clock in the morning. Oh, my one gosh. Of my most, one of my most vivid memories of actually Beijing was right after um, Usain Bolt won his first 100-meter dash um gold medal um in all of his olympics 
uh, we had just won the semifinals to go to the gold medal match. Okay. We were, we were pulling up into McDonald's in the Olympic Village the same time he was, and he was like dancing in the line and going crazy because he had just won his medal. It's around his neck, <laughs> and everybody's going wild because he's the fastest man in the world. And he's literally right next to me and talking to him, and it was just like, wow, he's even eating McDonald's, which is unbelievable. So, so all the Olympians McDonald's. are eating McDonald's. And that's China, you know. That's in just London, China. I guarantee you, it wasn't the same whatsoever. And right. Rio was not the same thing whatsoever. But different right. Olympics have the different types of things that they do, and yeah, it was definitely that. You know, when I played in China, which was just uh, wow, it must have been four years now ago in Shanghai. Shanghai is the best city in China, no questions asked, to live. But I still, I mean, it's expensive to eat good food in China. And really, in Shanghai, if I want a good steak in Shanghai. I'm paying like eighty to a hundred dollars. Holy a cow! Really? That I know is not dog. You know that um, is insane. Yeah, and if I wanted a good burger, it's going thirty-five, forty bucks for a good burger. Oh my gosh! What about so vegetables? Nice, what about like oh, nice vegetables? Whew, those are tough. Those are tough for sure. Um, it's just the, the the food. It's just the quality of food is not like it is here in the United States. And my son lost six mm-hmm. pounds in the in the month that he was there. He's got a peanut and tree nut allergy. There's Logs right there sitting next to me right now. Hey, what's going on, Logan? <laughs> um, and uh, he lost six pounds. And we were sit about 45 minutes to an hour outside of the city center in our training center. And when we would go into the city center for the weekends, he would be like, I'd like, do whatever you want on the menu you get, man. I need you to eat. And he would be eating like $50 steaks because I was like, <laughs> I don't care what you got to do right now. You need to eat, man. Yeah. And, uh, and after a month, they left, and I was there for about four to five months by myself. But it was the best thing because it's not easy living in China with a family. Wow. Especially wow. Especially with one who has a lot of allergies like my son has. So, yeah, that's interesting. But, so uh, you go over there for the Olympics then, and mm-hmm. not only is it like so hard to eat, the pollution. You mentioned the pollution, right, when you mentioned going over yep. there. So you, it's noticeable. So you get all these athletes. They're eating McDonald's oh, yeah. when they're used to eating healthy, and the pollution is – sure. is, is It hits you? Yeah, it, it hit you hard, and and it didn't hit us that hard because what happened was right after we had um, got to Beijing, about three days later, they had it all down to a science that they shot rockets up into the the atmosphere, and they made it rain for three days straight. I mean, the hardest rain I've been, and I've been in St. Louis, Missouri for a long time, born and raised there, mm-hmm. and it rains hard sometimes. Mm-hmm. This rain was nothing compared to to anything I've seen before. And they built on the walkways about a foot and a half to two feet high a separate planked walkway because it was flooding in the village. It was so hard coming down. The sewers couldn't even handle all of it. Once it finally went down and all of the pollution pollution just dissipated, you could see this mountain range about 250 miles away in the distance, which was unbelievable. And for the rest of the Olympics, it was perfect. Um, no pollution, nothing whatsoever. Wow. Now, go to four years ago when I was in Shanghai, and I'd be traveling all around China playing different teams in different areas. You go up to the north, and that's where all the factories are. And I can't even see a person that is five feet in front of me. Oh, my gosh. It was that bad. I oh, my live gosh. In, in Shanghai, and it would blow from the north to the south on the Shanghai. And I, I lived in a 48-story building, and I lived on, like, the 38th floor. And there was another six buildings, which were about 50 feet away from me in all these different directions. And half the time, I couldn't even see them. Oh, my because gosh. Because it was that bad. It was unbelievable. That is unbelievable. Yeah. So I'm giving, I'm giving it a bad rap, obviously, right now. You know, traveling with a kid was – by far the best experience that we as a husband and wife have ever done before. I mean, okay. giving your son and even in China, because he learned a lot of valuable lessons in China. I mean, we would consistently talk to him about like, this is how some people in the world live and yeah. it's not easy, you know? And he, he, our son adapts really, really well because of the fact that we took him everywhere with us overseas you know, wherever we went, he went for for the first you know seven uh, seven years of his life or six six years of his life, which was awesome. So, how old is Lo- Logan? Right, Logan's about to turn eight on the twenty fourth of this month. Okay, and so he um, he stopped traveling overseas when he was six. Okay, so and you guys for where was he born? 
so he was born here in uh, actually right down the street from where we live in Long Beach Sound, Los Alamitos, California. Okay. Six weeks after he was born, the, um, I was already in Germany where I was playing in Berlin, and they flew over. Okay. And stayed. Um, I guess it was about six months that okay. they were there. Came back here for three months, and then right back uh, for nine months overseas. And at the end of that, or back to Germany. At the back end to Germany. Of, um, at the end of that year, we got him into German school. Because in Germany, it's a law at two years old, if you are employed by a, a German company, your son or daughter has to be, it's mandatory for them to be in school. Really? At, the, at two? At two. Wow. So he would go from eight to three o'clock every single day. Every uh, five days a week five days at a two week. years old. It's mandatory. Mandatory. He was in a German diplomatic school, so very like high high quality school. Three hundred and sixty euros a month it cost, but only cost us eighty one, and the German government um, took care of the other two hundred and whatever it was eight seventy nine. And you were employed um, by a professional German uh, German volleyball yeah, team. It's called Berlin Recycling Volleys, um, okay. and uh, and I was employed by them, and so. He after we he was only in school for about a month just to hold his spot that was at that school and then when we came back he was there for a full nine months and after about seven months he was already speaking German really well wow. uh, and he would be in his room playing and singing in German and playing in German and talking and it was just so funny. This is before um, he turns three. This is this before, before three. He turns three and then was he speaking time, better German than English? Um, you know, he was pretty dang good at both. He would he would translate for my wife at the grocery store sometimes. Oh yeah, um, because it was amazing. And then by the the second year he was there in school, the full year. After about three months there, he was pretty much fluent, like unbelievable. Yeah, uh, and it was just so cool because to see his brain working and just it just it was just the, one of the neatest things that we've ever seen before. And I had to speak German because I was the captain of our team, and so I knew all the stuff that he was saying. And, and my wife's like, "Is it right?" I'm like, "Mom, it's not only is it right, but he has the perfect dialect too, which is unbelievable." And I speak like uh, you know uh, uh, an American speaking. German, you know, and he's speaking like an, uh, an actual Berliner, which is pretty wow. unbelievable. And so yeah. it was really, really cool. That is awesome. So then, okay, so where'd you go after uh, And German? then we were there for four years. He was there for, yeah, four at four and a half. Four years. He so went, he was there. A, you guys were there a long time. You kind of established roots in Berlin yeah, pretty, yeah, pretty we, well. Yeah, we, we had some very good roots there, a lot of good friends. Um, yeah. At about a little over four and a half, we went back to the States. And then at about five years old, we went over to China. Um, and then he only stayed for a month and I stayed for five. But in the meantime, he got into a school here in the United States down where we lived in California. Mm -hmm. And um, – and, you know, he, he just adapted so well into school and met friends and was just unbelievable at how well he just got into a group and just learned everything. We got back and then we went over to Poland and uh, he went to a, a Montessori in Poland. In Poland. Uh, and it was all Polish speaking, of course. So he was in um, school in Germany, then the United States, and then the third school was in Poland. Now, right? Poland, exactly, yep. exactly. Okay. Um, and it was just, it was just such a cool thing for for him, especially that it gave him the opportunity to learn, you know, different cultures, um, different languages, which is cool because he would pick up Polish words super fast. Wow, I mean, so fast just because he had that part of his brain working. He'd be coming home, and I didn't learn any Polish at all. He'd be coming home and he'd be teaching me Polish words. And I'm like, man, this is unbelievable. And uh, Where were so you guys in Poland? We were in a small little city called Jury, which is near to Katowice, which is down by Le like the uh, the Czech Republic uh, yeah. border down there. Okay. Great little spot. Um, and uh, in, like Czech Republic, like Slovakia border right there. And it was all oh, great, great little spot. Super cheap. Unbelievable how cheap it is to, to go to Poland. Really? Um, I mean, you know, the very first meal we got at this Italian restaurant, we went over there. And I've been to this restaurant three or four times before that because my teams had played at this against this team. 
We got two large pizzas. We got uh, a mozzarella caprese. My wife got a pasta. I got a beer. My wife got a glass of wine. My son got a, a Fanta. We got ice cream for dessert. Um, and it was 12 U.S. dollars. What? For all $12? Of that. And that was like a $2 tip that I gave her too. Was it the cheap? Is it the cheapest place you've been? In By Poland? far the cheapest place I've ever gone to in my whole entire life. Really? No Interesting. Wow. And it's nice. Money. It's a cool oh, place. Oh, it's beautiful. And the amount of money I saved in comparison to uh, Berlin, just in Berlin is one of the cheapest capital cities in Europe still to this yeah. day. Um, I, I, I was getting to pay the exact same amount of money in both places. And I must have saved $10,000 more living oh my in gosh. Poland than living in Germany. And how long were you in Poland? Uh, we were there for seven months, um, and then I tore. I I thought I tore my meniscus again in my knee for the f- the third time, um, and uh, so I went to Berlin, got some X rays on my knee, and saw the doctor who performed the last surgery that I had on my knee, and uh, finally I made a deal with the club that I could go home. I knew I was going to retire at the end of that year anyway. Okay, and I I made a deal with the the the, the team that I would. I would just go home early and, uh, and if it got better, I would come back. There's no way I was ever going to come back, but yeah. uh, if it got better, I was going to come back. And then, um, if, if it didn't, then I would just stay home and they continue to pay me my salary through until it was done. Oh, cool. It was great. And so I got to do pretty much didn't have to have a job for like four months until my camp started up and just kind of had a little nice yeah. relaxing time with the fam and just retired from volleyball. It was great. And then I got this job here at Long Beach State in my camps, and then the real world started to kick in a little bit. <laughs> and now it's now, so now you are oh, so now Logan is in school. It's uh, a second it's grade now. To, yeah, at a private grade. school out here. Yeah. Okay, so it's gotten to be it's consistent now. You're there. Consistent. Yep. Yeah. And so you see and, that the travels have been. Oh man. Just like I, awesome. It sounds like they've just been awesome for you and your family. By far the best thing I think, and we've talked about this my wife and I so many times. The traveling was one of the best things we could have ever done for him. And so many people get scared to travel with their kids and they just get anxiety about it. And we tell everybody that we know is it's the best thing that you can ever do for your kids is to take them places and travel, yeah. see the cultures and learn those cultures. That was probably the best thing about us being over there for nine months at a time as we were fully engulfed in those cultures yeah. that, you know, we, we met unbelievable people in, in Istanbul, Turkey, where Turkey is a Turkish people are very um, accommodating, like homey people, but it takes a long time for you to gain their trust. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, was, I put it there two years and I didn't know, I didn't even see anybody's house the first year, except for one guy's. The oh my gosh. Year, I don't think I ever saw my own house because oh, really? we were invited to every single thing ever, every single night um, there. And it was just unbelievable. It was so cool. So, so cool. Yeah, that's super people cool. People just got to get out there and travel, man. And it, it just, I think what you guys are doing is phenomenal that you're giving these families opportunities to be able to go see other places. And and live there for what three and a half four months. Well, we're we're doing that, but yeah, we don't. the The idea is to take other families for several weeks. Yeah, if, if we can get it to the point where we can get families that will go for that long, that'd be cool. Heck yeah, but which, so, is, which is great. So you you would stay in these places. You know, you you were living there, and Logan yep. was young. So was your son. Um, I mean, you see this as part of him when he was oh, yeah. he was real young. It's not like he. Because a lot of people are always like, oh, they won't remember. But like, oh. he, he just, it's just part of who he is, right? I mean. Oh, 100%. He remembers so much. I mean, of course, you know, he took his first steps when we were in Puerto Rico. He doesn't remember that at all, you mm-hmm. know. But he remembers so much of Poland. And he remembers his friends from Germany and and Poland. And he remembers the, the terrible smells from China. Yeah. <laughs> it's just he remembers all these little vivid things that are in his mind and we'll bring something up and he'll not, he won't remember. And then all of a sudden he'd be like, Oh yeah, wait, you're talking about this. We're like, exactly. You know? And when he, he was like, well, so like when he was like four five, six, seven, when he started getting to the age where he might remember you had already been traveling with him. He had been traveling a lot oh, yeah. and living in other countries. So was he just so 
like was his personality just adaptable and kind of ready to go yeah. and used to airplane and it just he, used used to he was flexible even yeah, he even though so he won't remember flexible. it so flexible I mean he would he uh, he would be like yeah when are we gonna go on an airplane again you know and I'm like oh it's coming soon don't worry you know he would he's very antsy my wife did an unbelievable job though of this is that she always took him places and always made it an adventure yeah and and she didn't just sit in inside the apartment when. I would consistently be like, oh, my God, you're spending money. You're doing this. You're doing that. That's why he is the way he is today. Is yeah. because my wife took it everywhere. He always wanted to go on an adventure or go to a museum or go to a, a, a I almost said Spielplatz, a playground in Germany. Like all these different things. He would come to my matches every single match. And it would be super late at night. But he would fall asleep in the gym with 7,000 fans screaming as loud as they could. But he would just fall asleep. Yeah. <laughs> It was just the funniest thing ever. And so he just adapted so well to all these different uh, times. And I started to feel bad because I kept on taking him different places, all these different places. And I was like, man, we got to get him to one spot. And he just chills at. Of course, we get home, we get settled down in our house that we've had for a couple of years down in, in South Orange County. And then me driving back and forth an hour each way to, to, um, to, our, to our school, our university every single day. And finally, my wife is like, we need to move up to Long Beach. And I'm like, no, <laughs> not again. Move again. Move him again. Change schools again. Um, and then we changed schools at the end of last year and then changed them to another new school um, at the beginning of this year where we're going to keep him at for a long time. But this is like his eighth school yeah. uh, before he's even eight years old. But he loves his new school. How much do you love your new school, Lux? So much. Yeah, it's awesome, so huh? Awesome. Yeah, it's so cool. Nice. <laughs> yeah, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> so are you excited then to have like uh, consistency? I mean, uh, you look at like all the benefits and everything, but are you excited? Are you looking at it like, okay, this will be good too. Have some time yeah, where he's. I, I am. The only thing that I get scared about is because of my job is I never know where I'm going to be. Yeah. I, mean, I could leave tomorrow and go to Minnesota, you know, and, right. and go to the women's team. You know, I never know what's next but i'm just excited that we finally get him into a school that that we really love um that he really loves it's got the catholic based um religion that that i grew up my whole entire life as well with the, the great mm-hmm. school and the high school back in st louis um and you know i'm in knowing of how flexible he is yeah. i don't have a worry that if i have to pick up and leave in two years and go to a better job and in, in you know 10 states over He'll be totally fine with that. It'll be fine. Be yeah. And, yeah. And I just know that now that he's just so good. Do I want to do that? No, of course not. You know, yeah. I want to keep him to a spot that he feels comfortable and he sees the same kids year after year after year in his class like I did. But at the end of the day, what he has done in changing schools and changing countries and all this stuff has made him the person that he is today. So, but you kind of have two jobs, right? So you've got Long Beach State, you're the coach. Yeah, assistant coach at Long Beach State. Yeah, okay. and then I have my own volleyball camps. And that's um, Tzinski's well. Elite Volleyball, right? Yep, yep. And I also work for for a volleyball company back in St. Louis, Missouri, called All Volleyball as well. Okay. Um, and so I do that, and then get uh, clubs to sign up for you know gear and 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 shoes and stuff like that as well. Um, yeah. So I'm busy, but I love it. That's what I've always been known to do. Is I'm always been busy, you Just, know. And, yeah, um, getting after it. Yeah. It's a different kind of busy, and in California, man, you got to grind. That's for sure. It's not a cheap place to live by any means. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so it's not like living in St. Louis, Missouri, where I'm not saying it's 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 not a grind, but it's much cheaper cost of living, obviously, than in California. Here. Yeah, it's a pretty easy place to live. How's your commute out there? Do you commute? No, commute? man, I got to I, I have a golf cart, so I have a three-minute golf cart ride. This oh, okay. Now, so since so you, you moved, like, right by work. Right next to work, man. Awesome. Like, literally, I can almost see where I work from my house, which is great. So That is awesome. I said, if I'm going from an hour each way, I'm going for, to, to nothing each way. So yeah. I'm going to get all that time with the fam. Well, I liked – I was looking at your website for Tuzinski's Elite Volleyball, and I liked your ACE uh, uh, method, oh, yeah. the attitude, yeah. communication, effort. And it was kind of cool because, like, I had just seen – I don't know if it was the exact same three things, but it was essentially the same thing in relation to business, Oh yeah, like, a few days ago. So it was so funny because I was looking at it and I was talking to Lauren and I was just like, oh, my gosh, this is crazy. I was like, this is, like, how it is for everything. Like, you can't control – this is all you can control. So you apply that to volleyball and feel – 
Do you, I yeah. guess you do that in your camps and you do that with your players that you coach? Yeah, we, I do it with my camps and our, our head coach has the same philosophy. He just doesn't say ace attitude communication. He always says communication, effort, attitude. Yeah. Um, those are just things. Good night, bud. I love you. Good night. Um, and so that's like, for me, you know, not only is it a volleyball thing, it's a life thing. Right. It's, that's how I try to talk to the kids about it. And, and the parents love that is because ace obviously is a volleyball term and it works well to what I'm trying to go. But man, if you don't have a good attitude, I mean, why is somebody going to hire you? You know, yeah, yeah, you yeah. somebody who's going to bring people down in their company. You know, if you don't communicate, especially in this day and age, man, you ain't going to get nothing at all. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Communicate with your coworkers. And if you don't put a hundred percent effort in everything that you do, there's somebody out there that's going to, and mm-hmm. it's not easy, but it's uh, those are like the core beliefs that I have is that nothing will get given to you. Um, you know, especially for me, I, 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 it's funny for me. I probably had the, the best thing ever happened to me. My second professional job overseas in Greece, five matches into the, the, the season, I tore my ACL. Yeah, and, you know, terrible, terrible injury. Obviously, at the time, I thought I was the most unlucky person in the whole entire world. Um, but you know, two years, three so years, you thought you were done. After, I thought I was done. Yeah. And, and, uh, luckily I had a great surgeon. I had a great support system with my wife and my mother and my father and my brothers. And I had some great coaches that I had played for at Long Beach who, who took me under their wings and, and built me back up and, and got me recovered from the injury. And uh, it still took a couple of years. So I started playing good volleyball. But it was the best thing ever because I learned so much about myself. I learned how to become a man. I learned how to save money. I learned how to work and fight for everything that I have. Mm-hmm. That, that pushes you beyond the volleyball court. That just kind of sets you up for life because there's going to be a lot of ups and downs in life. And uh, if you can learn that it's not so bad, uh, if you can learn kind of like, I, especially in the, the athlete world, mm-hmm. uh, you always look at somebody else and you're always like, how does that guy make that much money? And I'm just as good as him. Mm-hmm. And it's like that in the corporate world too. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I had to get over that and say, man, I'm pretty happy with what I have right now. And yes, would I love to have what he has? No questions asked, but I'm going to work harder for it. I'm not going to complain about it. And, um, and that was a big thing for me, um, and kind of showed me that I wasn't invincible too, you know, just like focus on what you can control and that's it. Exactly. So that injury forward. was before the Olympics. Yep. That and- was, um, that was actually, uh, 2005. So it was three years before the Olympics. Um, and, uh, that was kind of something for me that after it happened, the national team was calling me all the time to come, and I couldn't come because obviously I couldn't play. Yeah. The second year, um, I went over to uh, I went actually I went to Belgium. After that season, they called me again, which was 2006, and I'm like, man, I can't I can't play again. I had a barely a average season overseas i need to get stronger i need to get healthier i need to play better volleyball if i'm even gonna have a chance on the national team yeah but okay so in 2007 the year before the olympics um i thought i'd get a call i was playing phenomenal volleyball i never got a call mm-hmm. and I coached, so, I, so i called the coach i said hey Hugh, cool. um you know why didn't you call me this year you know I'm, I'm better i'm playing great he's like well we have our team for the olympics already set Unfortunately, you're not a part of that. And uh, after the Olympics, we'll call you again to see if you want to come play in 2009. And I said, well, I know you give guys tryouts and playing on the national team helps out your contracts overseas. Give me a three-week long tryout. At least that's the least you can do. I'll make my way out to California. I was in Missouri by myself. And um, he was like, you know what? Be here by Monday. It was like Friday. And I was like, done. And so I got my, I drove out my car from Missouri, 28-hour drive. Three week long tryout. I made the team, uh, but the key says there's two re- two things. One is you're never going to start a match or even be on a roster for us ever. Um, <laughs> if you're going to make two hundred fifty dollars a month, and I said, dude, I'll take it, man. That'll get me on the team, and I'll take it. He's like, well, that's good because the three people in front of you didn't take it, and that's why you're here in front of us today. I said, I must be lucky. So every single day I worked my butt off. I didn't get to a lot of drills. And uh, three months after I made the team, I made my first roster. 
Wow. Uh, um, and then, uh, which was right in Anaheim, it was the pre-Olympic qualifier. We qualified for the Olympic qualifier. Four months later, I, I made my first roster traveling to Puerto Rico, qualified for the Olympics. Um, and then pretty much a year after he told me I wasn't going to make anything, I was in the Olympics and I won a gold medal, which is pretty cool. So. That is so cool. Yeah, so what's your mindset through, I guess the injury helped keep your mindset. You oh, just, yeah. you focused on your attitude, your communication, mm. your effort, and you just kind of every day slugged it out and just kept on exactly. rocking. Exactly. You know, keep, keep the communication open. Even if you're having a good or a bad day. Mm -hmm. My mindset always was just to be positive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the actual amount of days that you're going to be playing good in, in a sport at that level is not a lot, actually. You know, how can I be 80% of my 100% every single day in the gym? Yeah. Um, because, you know, we had a sports psychologist who was phenomenal. And he would consistently tell us that there's nobody – on every single given day that is at their 100% maximum potential. It's not possible. Right. You know, it's a sport. There's so many different variables that don't allow you to be there. So what is your everyday percentage going to be? It's not going to be 100. Right. But it's going to be a 60, then a 90, then a 50, then a 70, then a 40, then a 70. Yeah. You can't be that because you're not consistent. So you got to pick a spot that you can achieve every single time. And if 85% or 90% is your, is your maximum every single day, well then man, you better kill it that day. And hopefully mm -hmm. a couple of those days, you're going to be at like 95, 99, a hundred. Um, but you can't just automatically be at an 85 and then go down and up and down and up and down up. You got to have some sort of stability all the way through. Yeah. Uh, and so that was my whole thing was, man, if I can be consistent with the things I could control, which is my attitude, my communication and my efforts, well, man, the volleyball is going to come. Right. Uh, but if I'm a roller coaster with those things, I mean, man, how am I going to be able to consistently do something that I'm not good at every single day? Wow. Uh, and that really helped me out a lot. And so when I – that actually helped me out a really a lot because I tore my meniscus about three months before London Olympics. And that's why I didn't get to go. Um, oh, okay. I had a surgery and, um, and I couldn't get back on the court in time. So it was and a big so, bummer. It was a big bump, you yeah. know, especially if you're trying to repeat as gold medalist. You put four years in, and then boom, you get an injury that doesn't even let you go. Yeah. So my mindset had to be a little bit different. And from that point on, um, you know, the next year, I got a call from the national team head coach, and he's like, you know, we're, we're thinking about going a different direction with and get a lot of some of you older players out of there and go younger. And I said, you know what? I think that's a great idea. I'm, yeah. like, I'm not going to fight you on it. It's time for me to retire for the national team. I'm still going to play overseas. Uh, but this is a chance uh, to make something positive of this and not negative. And that's when I really started to ramp up my volleyball camps. Um, mm -hmm. And so I went from three camps a year to 12, 15, 24, 30 camps a year. Um, and so I made more money than being on the national team doing my camps um, and doing my job and kind of setting me up for – the rest of my life really. And, yeah. Uh, it was a great thing for me. Did you, so going back on the mindset and like the whole thing of the way that you made the team and everything leading up to Beijing, did, did that, I guess that helped you, right? When you got to Beijing oh, yeah. and that all of a sudden everybody got turned on their head with, you mentioned the McDonald's and the pollution and everything else. For I mean, sure. did you, did you kind of rally all the guys and was, I mean, it, it, that helped you Definitely get one, to one where the, you needed to be to win a gold in that environment. Yeah, right? one of the things for me was in in the Olympics, I was a serving sub, and so you know I'd come in every single set and I would serve. You know, and it, always as a serving sub, there's so many different mentalities. You're not going in to do the exact same thing every single time. Mm -hmm. You're gonna you're going in there yes to serve, but you're not serving the same person, the same ball, the same thing every single time, and so. You're going off of what the coach tells you. So one of the main reasons why I made the team in the first place was, one, it was my attitude, um, and it was the communication, the positivity I brought to all the other guys on the team. Um, and then, two, obviously I can come in off the bench and serve a pretty good ball and score points for our team. And so what it, the best part about being a volleyball player, I always say, is because volleyball is the total team, uh, team sport you know, you can't take the ball down like LeBron James and just take it by yourself and score. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to have three contacts. You need to rely on your teammates. And for me, and especially our guys, volleyball, this the sport helped us be able to adapt in the situations that we were. In the Olympics, you know, 
it, we thought sometimes we're like, man, we're eating freaking McDonald's every single day. I mean, this is terrible, but you know what? Everybody else is too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, if we're all there, we're all in the same playing field. Right. So we're going to kill it just like they're going to try to kill it just because we're trying to win a gold medal in the Olympics right now. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so, yeah, it was a bummer that we had to do that, but we felt like that gave us the best chance for us to win. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. They are everybody else is at a disadvantage. We're not. We can we can handle eating McDonald's. We can handle it. Exactly. Yeah. And the you other, guys didn't lose a single match. No. The other thing that really helped us out too, and this is actually not really a help, but it brought us closer, was the day before the first match of the year, uh, or sorry, two days before the first match of the year. Um, our head coaches. Uh, mother and father-in-law were stabbed at Tiananmen Square. So what? I don't know if you remember this, but this is a, this is obviously a no. long time ago, ten years ago. But there was a situation at Tiananmen Square um, in the Beijing Olympics two days before the first, or two days before, or the day before the opening ceremonies, that um, a a husband uh, and a wife were stabbed. A guy ran up the bell tower and then jumped off the bell tower and committed suicide. What? Um, this was all over the news and everything, but it was our head coach's even... mother and father-in-law. What? I do not even remember this. Yeah, and, and it's funny because a lot of people do remember this. Like, and, and if you saw something, you would. Um, and so we got the call. We were in the middle of practice, and he goes running out of practice. And we get we get the call from like the main head security official for um, uh, United States Olympic Committee, and he tells us what happened. They didn't know if it was an isolated attack or if it was just against USA people, um, or it, but yeah, it happened. Um, the dad died on the spot. Holy! The, the, wow. the mom, yeah, the mom was rushed to um the local hospital and then she was um medvaced back on the johnson and johnson airplane back to the united states and put into a hospital she was in critical condition she actually lived um but it was his wife's mo- mom and dad and he we didn't ha- we didn't see hugh our head coach until the quarterfinals of the olympics our assistant coach stepped in and coached us all the way through. And that just brought us even closer together than we already were. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we had the same team for about a a year and a half before that. We won every single tournament that we played in with that group. And so we won the pre-Olympic qualifier, the qualifier. Then we went on to win this four nations tournament in Germany. We won world league, our million dollar tournament, which we've never won before. That was about a month before the Olympics. And then we went straight to the Olympics and won the Olympic games. And, uh, we didn't even lose a match like in any of those. Mm-hmm. We we went like man, we went like I want to say we probably went thirty two and zero um, that whole entire stretch. We were just unbelievable. On fire. Our chemistry and our and our just the way we were as a, as a team, and it was just pretty pretty impressive. And then that whole thing happened, and we're like, man, this is. I mean, could it get any worse? We're already in McDonald's and. Our head coach's mother and father-in-law are one dead and one in critical condition. Um, And so it just brought us together. But the mindset, you know, your mind, gosh, man, people think that the pure athletic ability is like everything. And it is only like 40%. I Mm -hmm. mean, the mind mind is the difference maker on – there's so many good volleyball players in the United States, and we live in one of the biggest countries in the world, obviously. And to be able to pick for 12 guys, only 12 guys go to the Olympics. Um, you know, I've seen so many players that were way better volleyball players than I was. You know, jumped higher and stronger and hit harder and all these things, but the mind is the one thing that holds all of them back. Yeah. Um, and so we consistently at the Long Beach State, especially, we're talking about, you know, the mental game and we're having our guys read books um, uh, uh, on just some, some, some core, you know, teams that we've seen. I don't know if a couple books that, that we have our guys read, but mindset is one of them. Mindset. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a great book. Great, great book. We have them read the five dysfunctions of a team. Uh, we have them read the book legacy of the all blacks um, rugby team. Um, you know, that's it. That's an unbelievable. We have, 
um, our older guys reading Ego is the Enemy. Yeah, um, that's another I mean, one. That's a good so one. Many, there's, a, there's another one that they read called Outliers, which is phenomenal. Um, but it's just just some things that we think that are, are important and valuable that hold a team uh, lesson pretty much is, is some of the things. That, and I'm a big believer in that stuff. I pushed hard this past year for us to get a sports psychologist. Um, we don't have one. and uh, But we do a lot of things because I've, I've had one for a long time on the national team and overseas. And, and so I give a lot of that stuff that when I coach, a lot of that stuff is, you know, um, sports psychology stuff that I just like to throw onto the guys because – that's some power, powerful stuff, um, but that that helps out significantly outside of the team or the sports world as well into the real world. So y- y- you do this, and then um, I guess when you're traveling around and everything, I mean, did you this does this mindset? How do you take this in with your family? I mean, you're going into different environments that are difficult. Does it? Yeah, like one of the things that we're looking forward to is getting outside of our comfort zone as a family. Like, yes. so of course we don't want to get thrown into some extreme adventure or whatever with you know our family with you know our son. He's a toddler, yep. but For with sure. being all everybody going outside of their comfort zone as a family and him being with his parents that are out that are learning something and experiencing something new, we kind of uh, are looking at the whole mindset thing as a as a positive thing for him to experience that and kind of grow as a family go through it all as a family Uh, definitely nothing like what you were just saying with your coaches uh yeah in-laws and everything but just something tricky is not knowing how to find the grocery store and just everyday things that are just so easy in the united states you know that's exactly what i was going to bring up it's i think it's and the mindset part is is a big part of it is just the the adaptability. Um, you know, what happens when your flight is four hours delayed and you're at the airport and you can't find milk for your kid, you know, um, what are you going to do? You know, Mm. there was times that we would freak out and then we're like, man, you know what? There's no reason to freak out right now. We just need to rally the troops. uh, We always say, and, and just find it, you know, and what, 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 what's going to happen on a Sunday when in Europe the majority of the cities are closed on a Sunday, and you can't even you can't even get to the grocery store because it's they're all closed on a Sunday. What are you going to do? You know, and find food or whatever it is. Our our kid always um, he's always had a peanut and a tree nut and an egg allergy, and living in all these different countries, not being able to read the back of you know uh, a cereal box. You know, is it produced in a facility with nuts or is it not? You know, yeah. have no clue. At all. So you got to try to get a, a translator out and learn the words and, and all these different things. You know, that's why my son, you know, lost so much weight in China was because we lived in the middle of nowhere in a super, super nice, probably the nicest hotel I've ever seen in my whole entire world. And I've stayed in so many hotels, um, but he can only eat three things off the menu at all times. That's all it was. And he would eat the same three meals every single day. And he's like, Dad, I, I can't eat this anymore. I'm like, I don't blame you, bud. I don't blame you. <laughs> yeah. You know, we got to find a somewhere else. So we found this mall and we take a uh, we take a taxi to and from the mall for breakfast and lunch and dinner every single day to get him food, to change it up. And then when we couldn't finally find that, we bought groceries and brought them back. And it was just like – Man, this is just unbelievable how hard it is, but you will do anything to take care of your kid. It does not matter what it is. Yeah. And that's where we just learned how to be just so close as a family. That was one of the coolest things is, you know, when you are overseas, you don't have the luxury of a babysitter Mm -hmm. right next door. Mm Mm-hmm. We we did everything together for nine year or for nine months straight the whole entire time, and then even when we got back home, mm-hmm. lived about an hour from my wife's uh, mother and father, uh, and we still did everything by ourselves. <laughs> yeah, you know, we we never had a babysitter. We still didn't even have a babysitter. You know, like her mom and dad were closer now. We're twenty minutes away, so they'll come down and and, and watch our son now. So we'll get some date nights, which is pretty cool. But man, we didn't even have a date night for. I can't even tell you how many years, probably seven years that we had a kid. Wow. It's just no date nights and you just brought him everywhere. And, and he just came along. 
He tagged along and absolutely loved it. Our son is like the the kid that loves family more than anything. I mean, we'll ask him like, what was the best part of your day today, buddy? Like being with my mom and my dad playing golf. <laughs> do anything else. Nice. He's, he's just so genuine. You know, at that age, they're so genuine and he's just so true. Um, and it's so cool to, to hear that because not a lot of kids get that all in family mentality or, you know, atmosphere all the time, which is so cool. So what was your, uh, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time. What was your favorite place? Uh, just to kind of circle back to all that, that you lived or that you even lived for even a short period of time. Yeah. For, it's hard for me. And everybody asks me this question. It's hard for me because I look at a couple of different things. One, obviously just living with your family Two, did I get paid for my club? Because in Europe, it's not like you get paid on the same day every single month like you do in the United States. You, We would go three months, four months at a time without even getting paid. Um, and then they would pay us one salary or two salaries to try to make it up. And we're like on our last dime and we're like, oh, come on, man. Yeah. Um, but, you know, probably my favorite place uh, to live was Berlin, Germany. Yeah. Um, just for the fact of it was so much easier there with the, the insurance and the hospitals and everyone spoke English and it was easier. It was a pretty easy um, place to live. Yeah, really easy. Um, if I'm looking at like the culture, I loved Istanbul, Turkey. That was like, man, that was one of my favorite times living there. Just so much history, so much culture, the nicest people. Never once did I ever feel like I was at harm. Um, where people, we get this terrible rap about Turkish people and bombings and all this stuff, which is true, but I never felt like I was in trouble ever there. You were, you felt safer there than even in Berlin? Sometimes. Really? Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, my wife didn't wear the, the, the mask or anything like that and, and never did she have a problem at all. Hmm. Um, but, um, and then we really enjoyed living in Poland, uh, our last year. Um, obviously a very, very Catholic, uh, country. Um, you know, I made it, you know, my, my, a lot of my years overseas, it was all volleyball. And so we didn't take a lot of vacations and we didn't go see a lot of things because it was always consistently worrying about volleyball. Mm -hmm. Um, but when I told my wife after about a month, I got there and I told her, I think this is the last year she said, well, can you just can you just let us go see things whenever you have a break? And I got lucky with that team because normally I played on a team that was in Champions League. So the top two teams of every league, they go to Champions League or to a European Cup. So when the your team doesn't play, on the weekends you're going to be traveling and going to different um, oh, okay. countries to play matches against the top teams from those countries. Well, that, that year um, – our team that I went to was on a band, so they wouldn't let them play in the European leagues, only in the Polish league. And we were one of the, one of the best teams um, there, but they weren't paying the money to like the uh, the uh, the federation of uh, European volleyball, so they banned us. So we had every weekend off. Nice. And, and every weekend, I promised my wife, every weekend we would go somewhere. So we traveled everywhere that year. We went to the mountains we went to warsaw we went to vienna austria we went to berlin to go say what's up to some friends we went to czech prague um we went to all these different places every weekend and it was so much fun i mean we we saw everything we did everything you could ever think of we went everywhere we we did a ton of stuff and uh, we just had a ton of fun um, as a family. And uh, that was one of my favorite places too right there. Just because, one, you're able to because of the proximity where Poland is. There's so many different places to go to, which is phenomenal. Yeah. Um, but two, it was so cheap. <laughs> and so we could afford – I mean we would go to the mountains and we would get a, a cabin in the mountains for like $30. Wow. And it's like this beautiful cabin overlooking the, the resorts and are like, oh, my gosh. And the whole entire trip with gas for the weekend would cost us like 120 bucks. Oh, my gosh. Just, you, you can't do that anywhere else. I yeah. Mean, it, was, it was absolutely phenomenal. And so that was really, really neat to, to be able to explore. And, and my son was older at that point, so he would love to explore. We would take him to these uh, – you know, and overseas they have so many of these cool things that we don't have in the United States. I mean – in Poland, they have a ton of these indoor water parks 
Oh, yeah. With just these huge slides that go like from inside to outside. And they, they, you know, it's, it's 20 degrees outside and (laughs) you're flying outside into the water, which is heated at 110 degrees, you know? Oh, really? (laughs) Off of it. And my son absolutely loved it. He's always asking me, like, Dad, you know, can we go to the indoor water park? And I'm like, bro, we, we're in California. We, 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 uh... <laughs> exactly. You know, but he, those are things that he remembers, you know, yeah. like we, we live right next to the Long Beach airport. And my son, when he sees the airplanes, will still be like Flugzeug. And that's airplane in German. And he still, he'll still call it Flugzeug. Um, it's just, it's just the coolest thing ever. So. So do you guys have any plans to uh, travel anywhere new or any, uh, any adventures coming up? We don't have any adventures coming up. I promised my wife I would take her to Rome. She's been there quite a few times. That's her favorite city in the world. And so I told cool. her I would take her there. We are going to go to the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo. I've never gone to the Olympics as a, as cool. a spectator. Yeah. So with all the free flyer miles and hotels and stuff, points I have, we're going to do that. And it's going to cost absolutely nothing, which is going to be great. Sweet. Um, but we're going to go do that. And, um, and then at some point I got to get back to Berlin. They're going to, um, they're going to retire my jersey. They've retired my jersey. We're going to put me in the Hall of Fame there, and I'd like to go back. Nice. And, yeah, that's that was that for me. That was my wife didn't love it that much as I did. It, we were in a totally different time, you know. Like I said, I was traveling in and out, and yeah, and I love the easiness, and I love because I would always worry about just my son with his allergies mm-hmm. and is he going to be okay? Is everything going to be all right? He was always all right. Cause my wife had the best care of him for sure. You know, but with me traveling so much, I couldn't be there. You know, if something were to happen, I don't know what I would do, you know? And so we always had a plan in place, but uh, that's a place that I loved was Berlin because um, I felt the, the, the most at ease with my son overseas and my family, because I, I always knew nothing was going to happen there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and my play showed in that too, because I played some of the best volleyball in my life there because of that. Too. You could so, focus on that instead of worrying about, right, right. Exactly. Cause you know, when you're over there, it's you and your family, you know, you were the, the sole caretaker to make sure nothing goes wrong with your, your family. And so, um, sometimes when you're out there, you're not just thinking about volleyball the whole entire time. You're also thinking about your, your wife and your son. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Huh? Well, that's cool. Well, yeah, it's fun. I appreciate everything. And, uh, yeah. So I guess Tazinski's elite volleyball, what's the website? Yep. What's the website? Yeah, exactly? www.tazinskielitevb.com. Okay. Um, and that's T O U Z I N S K Y. Yep elitevb.com okay got it got it okay cool yeah, so cool. that's me you know that's uh, i've had that business for 14 years it's kind of like my baby um you know i love going and teaching the kids how to play volleyball uh i love meeting new people and that's kind of like the the continuously moving around part that i still love to do is um is you know just travel around and teach kids volleyball because i've had this for, for so long you know it's amazing that my camp in, in Nevada was my very first ever camp. Had it for 14 years straight now. Wow. I've seen, you know, this is an all girls camp and I've seen, you know, the, the high school coaches, kids grow up from being a newborn to 14 years old. Now it's the craziest thing ever. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of these kids grow up and go division one college volleyball. I've seen some of these kids, finish school high school and get married and have four kids now <laughs> it's yeah. the greatest thing ever in that city and so a lot of the camps that i have have been going on for 14 7 5 8 years in a row um and those are relationships that we've made for a long time and like i'm always i'm, I'm always gaining new camps as well which is pretty cool but i'm very loyal to the camps that i have now because that's been who have always stuck with me which is pretty cool yeah, well, hopefully you've got some more Olympics in your future with either yeah. uh, players you've coached through camps or yeah. uh, or in another capacity with the team itself. Thank you know, you. so yeah, that'd be cool. Well, cool. Well, I appreciate your time. I don't want to take up you. too much of it, but yeah, this is so cool. I mean, it's awesome to. Uh, I love hearing about living all over the world and hearing about your different experiences, and of course, talking about like the Olympics and the mindset. I'm like Definitely. all about that. So I love hearing that, and that's awesome that you're out coaching so many kids through your camps yeah. and university and everything that, that same cool. mindset. 
what's cool now is that two of the guys on our team at Long Beach State were on the, the national team this past summer. And they're traveling all around now like I was. Oh, geez, man, it seems like a long, long time ago, 10 years ago, 11, 12 years ago. Um, and they're going to be there pretty soon, hopefully in the next Olympics. Both these guys will be there, which is Sweet. awesome. So I'm still getting that mentality. And you'll be there. Mentality. Yeah, exactly. Now that's the cool part. So Yeah, yeah. Cool. Anytime you guys want me to have me on, I'm in. It's awesome. It's so much fun to talk to you guys about yeah. this. Best of luck with your guys' business and uh, – and have a fun, have a lot of fun with the family, man. It's cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Hey, I really appreciate it, Scott. And uh, yeah, I'll stay in touch for sure. Thanks, guys. Appreciate right. it. Good luck. All right, bye. All right, thanks.